What's up, everybody? Welcome to Dane Miller's Strength Secrets, and we have an awesome guest here today by the name of Dr. John Garhammer. Dr. John Garhammer, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Um, before, hopefully you say thank you. <laughs> before we go into it, Dr. Garhammer has done a ton of research in the sport of Olympic weightlifting. He's done a ton of research as far as uh, biomechanics is concerned, and I would say you are like the the quintessential main person that most people look to as far as like that the godfather of um, sports science around Olympic weightlifting, and that's why I, I'm extremely excited to have you on the podcast. Well, thanks, Dane. I'm, I'm glad to be here and to share some information with you. All right. So one of the first things I wanted to dive into was entirely based around um, your indirect impact on me as a as an athlete and and one of the the first charts that i was exposed to that that was from the research of dr garhammer was um your i don't even remember what it was called the like the the power output chart where it, it just shows um you know jerk snatch clean and what that power output what the pull power output is and then comparing it to bench and deadlift and i and part of that conversation that i we had had before the podcast that I did leave out was I was talking with my strength coach saying, Hey, you know, what can I do to get a little bit stronger? What or to get a little bit more explosive? I want to be a state champion. I want to accomplish all this stuff. This is an eighth or ninth grade. And he had the chart on the, on the wall and he had noticed that myself and my training partner, you know, so we were in eighth grade and all we wanted to do was bench press all the time. Right. So it's like bench press and do curls. Um, not much different from my existence as a 35 year old. Um, but he took me over to your chart and he said, this is a science and, and this is the power output that you're going to get from doing a jerk or from doing a clean or from doing a snatch. So if you want to be explosive and you want to be fast and you want to be powerful, you better start snatching a lot more frequently. And I think that that was something for me that I took to heart. Um, and I one, I want to thank you for doing that research. But two, it, it's really had a big impact on me because... I didn't even come from, you know, my, my coach was not a, an Olympic weightlifting coach. He just happened to use the Olympic lifts for sports performance. And I Mm -hmm. think that my background is, is a little different from, from a lot of people who, who sit there and they really will point, point to your research and they're like, well, they might be strictly Olympic weightlifting background, uh, based. And, and I've come from that background where it was more football wrestling and, and throwing track and field. And so, I think it's interesting to see that not only did your research have a huge impact on the sport of Olympic weightlifting, but it's done a tremendous amount of impact on the world of sports performance. And I think that, you know, working what you've done and, and even I, I got a, I had a chance to meet with Alvar Meal and it's just one of those things where it's, it's pretty cool to be around guys that have that much, your, your, your level of expertise in the field. Well, I spent a lot of time with uh, coaches, including Al, coaches that are obviously interested in in science-based information about uh, training. With the power output, uh, we know there's a sport called powerlifting. Right. And I've had friends in the sport. I've gone to power meets, and it was pretty clear to me, being a weightlifter, that uh, power was greater in doing an Olympic lift based on the technical definition Mm -hmm. of what power is. And I looked in the literature and there was relatively little about real power measurements with lifting movements. So I did uh, snatch and clean and jerk related work starting uh, mid 70s at UCLA. And I had already been lifting since uh, say 64 was my first meet so i had some feel for doing the olympic lifts and i i intuitively knew because of my physics background uh, degrees that uh, i could measure power accurately from film Mm -hmm. and i did the poll the only paper that i found published about power in the power clean 
did it a little bit wrong. They did from liftoff until catch of the bar. Okay. Well, we know that the pull, the main part of the pull, ends in what we call the top pull position. And then there's a follow-through yeah. where you can impart some impulse and some energy to the bar, but it's it's slow and small compared to the liftoff to top pull. I also knew from observation and experience that the second pull from the power position to top pull was even faster and uh, going to result in more power. So I started actually measuring these things from video, uh, from eight millimeter film at that time or right. 16 millimeter film at that time. Didn't shift to video analysis till around 1990. And sure enough, I found very high values for power output in the entire pull from liftoff to top pull and higher values for the second pull from power position to top pull. And of course, as you might expect, as you go to heavier weight classes, the power output is more because the timing is similar. To do the lifts right, there's a very small range in time for, say, first pull and second pull. So the bigger you are, the more weight you're lifting, the higher the power output's going to be. I extended the, the analysis to the jerk because I saw the similarities in the second pull to the jerk thrust. Yeah. And sure enough, you analyze world champion weightlifters and their power outputs for second pull in the snatch, second pull in the clean, and the jerk drive are very similar. Right. Because the movement pattern, the muscle groups involved are very similar. And I said, well, we need to look at power lifting because there's always talk about, well, you know, powerful deadlifter and squat and whatnot. And again, there was very little real data as to what the power output was for the power lifts. So I did... Uh, Squat, deadlift, and bench. I got some film that I took myself, and I got some given to me. And it was what I expected, you know. The deadlift may be much more than the, the top uh, clean for a given weight class. So let's talk about super heavyweights. You, know, you see people deadlift 1,000, and you see people clean and jerk uh, over 500. Mm -hmm. So it's like twice as much for the deadlift, but it's slow. Yeah. And people don't take into account that in power calculations, time is in the denominator. Yeah, yeah. So if the time is twice as great, the work done in the numerator term is going to get cut in half. And sure enough, you know, maximal <clears throat> deadlifts were in the range of half maximal cleans when it comes to power output. And the other interesting thing that needs to be brought out, in training, you don't do maximums that much. It turns out in Olympic lifting, I have enough data to say that probably the maximum power output for a good technician, experienced lifter, happens anywhere from maybe 85 to 90% of their maximum. Okay. If you keep raising the weight, the power output starts to drop right. some. and it's it's extreme in the deadlift if you take a good deadlifter and compare their maximal deadlift power output to a 90 percent of maximum power uh, deadlift the power shoots up on the 90. tremendously on the 90 percent because they can move it fast right right the weight goes down 10 percent but maybe the time gets cut in half in some cases right so I, I learned a lot by doing the measurements to understand the lifts and thus to make recommendations. So if you really want the explosive power, you're better off doing 85, 90% as an emphasis. I'm not saying you don't do heavier, but if you want to emphasize power, do that range of More loading so. compared to your max, right. 85, 90%. It may vary a little bit for different people, but that's a good guideline, okay. I think. And uh, when I presented this kind of information at clinics and, and lectures, a number of people really were interested in it. They thought it was important information, like you did when yeah. you saw the chart. Right. Right. And I think that's, for me, at the time, my, my first response was like, I just want to bench press, you know, because you're, yeah. you're an idiot, 13, 14-year-old. And then you start to think about it. 
And I think that one of the biggest complaints from people who aren't, you know, I, I have a book, Olympic weightlifting and sports performance. I am a diehard Olympic weightlifting proponent. And one of the complaints that we get is, oh, well, well, that's great, but it doesn't, there's still a diminishment or diminishing point of do, do the, does the Olympic lifts, will they transfer to something like the shot put that's done at a much, even a much faster movement. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where, and I don't know if you can get into the physiology behind what actually happens to your body when you do an Olympic lift versus what you do, what happens to your body when you do, you know, a strength movement, or you'll see guys doing like Hatfield squats with 900 pounds and somehow they might justify that that is going to have a better impact on the speed of a shot put than or the speed of release of a shot or a discus than if they would you know execute a, a power snatch or a, or a power clean at 80 percent or 75 percent and and to me just on the surface level it seems like why wouldn't you see the that the fact that the power output is greater for the clean or for the power snatch that it would immediately have a much better chance of transferring over into the circle. And I, and essentially that's the, the work that Dr. B did, uh, Bunderchuk, was that what's the transfer training of a, of a power clean or a power snatch to, you know, the hammer throw or to the, the discus or, or the shot? And I think that's one question. Maybe, I don't know if you could touch on the, the actual physiological adaptation behind what happens when you perform, you know, a, a 75% or an 80% power snatch well there's two ways to look at this transfer question of course it all comes down to specificity of training but if you look at such a large variety of sports the so-called triple extension movement uh, ankle knee and hip exists uh, vertical jump for example I did some work with the vertical jump the counter movement vertical jump and lo and behold the power output was very similar to the second pull or values. the or the dip now there's they're even doing this with push presses they're doing this with the dip in and drive and the jerk it's almost the exact same output that you're going to see in the dip and the drive and the jerk yeah so there there are other things involved in each particular movement you know a shot put a vertical jump a, a second pull and clean or snatch but the ankle, knee, and hip extensors mm -hmm. are involved and are very important. In, in the rotary throw and the shot put, there's a tremendous triple extension from lower extremities, but it's superimposed on that is a rotational movement. Mm -hmm. And then a finish involves upper body. So the, the exact muscle patterns, the exact muscle groups and the muscle patterns that are involved in different phases of an activity are critical. And again, in doing Olympic lifts, like say a power snatch or a power clean, triple extension is very important. There's also a shoulder shrug and there's also some emphasis on using the arms. They, they use the term pulling yourself under. Mm -hmm. So let's just focus on the triple extension in the lower extremity vertical jump. Why is the power output in the vertical jump so similar to second pull and snatch or clean? You're only using body weight. Well, you can accelerate faster, you can cut the time down, but the loading is just body weight instead of body weight plus, plus a mass, yeah. So that's one consideration. You mentioned the bench pressing. I, I did a few uh, studies of bench press and of course what you would expect you have a very limited muscle mass involved in the bench compared to uh, pull full, from yeah. The floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so you expect to a lower muscle mass involvement you're gonna have a lower power output and of course that's what we find when we do the analysis so in terms of specificity and transfer I think biomechanically and musculoskeletal wise uh, looking at the muscle groups that are involved in the range of motion of the joints are important. Now physiologically you're talking about energy systems and almost any sh very short-term high-intensity uh, effort is going to depend on the ATP-CP system. 
you have to extend the duration of the activity to say mm -hmm. 10, 20 seconds before you significantly start to pull in the lactic acid system. So I think we can keep it simple there and say, yeah, if you're doing training that's very short-term efforts and often repeated, you're going to use ATP, CP system, and that's going to help transfer. Right. Now you go to general training, preparatory training, and uh, specific training to peak for competition. You make adjustments. You, you bring down the repetitions. You may increase the intensity. The throwers are going to try to throw a little farther. They're maybe not going to make as many close to maximal effort throws, but it's more and more similar to the competition environment yeah. in terms of exactly what happens with the timing and the muscle group range of motion uh, that's involved. So coaches nowadays with, with the availability of, of video and instant playback, they can really learn by watching in slow motion what's going on and if there are any changes from, say, warm-up throws to the actual competitive. competitive throws. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's where I was bringing up even with you uh, when we had talked about um, the footage that you had been analyzing. I said, you know, imagine if you had the, the, the footage quality that we can get from hook grip or all things gym where you're sitting there like, holy crap, look at this, stuff, how, how well you can see, you know, what I showed you, Quo, yeah. and what you can see out of that. The the science has, I mean, what and what's sad though, from my perspective is that you were doing this work in the 70s and 80s with 16 millimeter film, right. and there hasn't really been a ton, at least in my mind, like there's a lot of good researchers out there. And I also make this joke that, you know, Andy Galpin's a great researcher, but if, if, if you were existing now when it, with your research with social media, this stuff would be all over the place. And no one's really taking advantage of it from the weightlifting perspective on how to how to transfer it to sports performance because it's like we're almost getting too caught up with like uh, jumping with bands or reverse bands and, and all this other stuff that can really get done and accomplished with the Olympic lifts. Mm -hmm. And you've shown this, you know, mm -hmm. 35 years ago. Right. More than that. Right. I mean, variation in training is important to get away from monotony. So in certain periods of training during the year, I, I tend to use the preparatory uh, phase of training or, you know, just general almost conditioning type training. You can put in some different movements, but when you start to get into a cycle that's going to lead up to an important competition, you want to be as specific as you can be. So some of the unusual training techniques, such as bands and chains, aren't as valuable in an actual training cycle leading up to competition for most activities. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you can't use some of it far out from important competitions, because it does provide some, some break in the monotonous training. Yeah. But as you get closer to competition, you want to be more and more specific. In weightlifting, that means use higher percentages of your maximum in training a little more often. Right. In throwing, you may throw less, but you may try to put more emphasis and more effort into each throw so it's closer to your max. Right. So the the step by step procedure over weeks and months have to lead to getting the organism as conditioned as possible for one or two specific types of events. Now, if you're just a shot putter, nothing else, good. That That's easier to accomplish. Right. If you're doing snatch and clean and jerk, you have three movements, actually, to worry about. And then you have auxiliary things that are critical, like leg strength, and right. that's connected with squatting. So it gets a little more complicated as there are more major components in the sport competition itself. But again, the key is specificity. Be more and more like the actual competitive event so that that sort of leads into my big question is that i'm you know i've i love playing around with different exercises and playing around with different rep schemes and tempos and um frequency and just basically setting up these experiments where i'll use the athletes sort of like guinea pigs where i'll say okay these three guys are going to do almost the exact same thing and we'll try and see what happens over that training block and then look at the training block, compare the results, and then try and develop 
you know, uh, an idea of their reaction curve to this different stimuli or whatever. And I sort of got this from, I got this directly from Dr. B is that he, his whole point in, in research was all based around the peculiarity behind peaking and how three guys could follow the exact same programming, but none like one hits a really, you know, peak performance, but the other two might hit a peak performance at a different point. Right. right? I guess what my question for you becomes is because you have that research background is what would you see as like the key factor behind like a sports performance coach like myself sitting here saying, all right, if if you're going to do experiments for as a sports performance coach in your setting, because you're not in a lab, this is, this is what I would recommend as the best way to do, to do these experiments, to better your, your knowledge of your athletes. I, I guess that's my question is what would you recommend or, or try to avoid if you were specifically just a, a sports performance coach? Well, what to avoid is, is the assumption that everybody's going to respond the same. And you've uh, mentioned that, that concept just a minute ago. So the coach really has to be a scientist in a sense that he, he reads literature and he thinks about how I can apply this to different athletes that I'm working with. And that's where somewhat of the art of coaching comes in. You apply scientific principles and you watch how each athlete responds. And as you say, you know, one type of training may result in athlete A having a great performance, maybe setting a PR, and the other two are not quite at their best. So then you have to modify something for those two that didn't do quite as well and see if it brings them to a new right. record level. So there's, it shows the importance of the coach and the coach thinking, the coach observing, the coach reading information from journals or practical applied type of right. uh, articles. And then trying what uh, the coach, he or she thinks is going to work and keep a record, you know, keep good records as to what's going on because if it doesn't work exactly the way you want, you, know you need to modify a yeah. little bit. Well, maybe I did too much here. Maybe I didn't do enough there. So you, I can't, I mean, people ask me questions about training. I, I need to sit down with a coach and say, we well, need to give me a half an hour's discussion of the background for this athlete. How long have they been training? What's yep. their training age? What are their strong and weak points? What injuries have they had? And if I get a good bit of information from the coach like that, I feel like maybe I can make a few worthwhile suggestions. Otherwise, it's a shot in the dark. Right, right. If I don't know what the athlete, I haven't seen the athlete train and compete a, a number of times, it's hard to give a definitive answer to a question about training. I can give general guideline type answers. Right. I wanted to go into a little bit on... When you were discussing the power output behind um, that top top pole or the second pole, I guess you could call it, where um, on the finish of a of a clean or or of a snatch, and I and it it took me back to one of the first things I was lucky where my dad was into strength and conditioning, and and one of the first um, things that we started to play around with this is like 1996 right in, in the and we had dial up internet but husker power the website existed and they were big into hangs like hang clean mm -hmm. and part of me thinks like i i somewhat believe that they sort of took your your knowledge and your information and that research that you had done and basically said all right well garhammer says that the top pulls essentially where you're or the the second pulls essentially where you're going to get the most power production so let's just train that. Um, and is there any value to that or is it also important or, or is it more about other aspects of the lift that's not just about power output, that there's, there are other things that, that come into play physiologically, uh, biomechanically, that, that makes it advantageous for sports performance-based athletes to do the full lift from the floor and to, to not just catch it in the power position either. Yeah, well, you, you move away from uh, weightlifters where obviously they need to lift from the floor in competition, so the whole movement's very important to them. You move to, to shot and discus throwers, most of their efforts are higher up. 
Mm -hmm. So it makes some sense to say, let's emphasize from the hang where you have a very explosive movement and very high power output. I don't agree that, I I don't disagree with the idea of putting emphasis on hang or from the box, let's say just above kneecap level. But again, monotony is something to be concerned about. So if, if that's what you do most of the time, it may not produce the kind of uh, adaptation you want. So all I'm saying is occasionally you can do some lifts, maybe in the early preparatory phase, from the floor, and then cut the movement range of motion back as you get closer and closer to competition. But if you just did hang power snatch, hang power clean, I mean, think about it, doing those two lifts month after month after month. That's monotony. That's a bad stressor effect on the body right so you could do three quarters or two thirds of the movements from the hang but i think it's important to do some with a full range of motion do you know is there any research when you when you said the blocks i had already immediately been thinking like the the comparison i don't know if there's any research on this at all um as far as power output, but if you would take somebody from the hang, and let's say, let's use the knee point, the a high hang set, we, we would just call it above the knee. Okay. Is there any comparison of power output on a high hang, so it stays above the knee, versus versus coming off the blocks, but the bar starts above the knee? So essentially, the, the, the starting point is just above the knee, but one is po- potentially potentiated with that eccentric movement, and the other one's more from a static, could be a, a dynamic isometric position. Is there any research that'll show like, oh, a high hang, you can get a little more power output out of versus that, that same position from boxes? Yeah, I'm not aware of anything specifically addressing that. It would be kind of hard to do because the timing is so short that you would need a very accurate measurement of time. And if you're using standard video, it's a 60th of a second between images. Those can be separated to uh, cut the time in half. There are more modern cameras that you can adjust to very short exposure times. So if you wanted to make a good research project to answer that question of the hang versus from the blocks just above the knee, It'd be tricky to do very accurately. But you can use common sense and look at some things that are happening. Like you mentioned, if you do the, from the hang, a lot of people will start the bar, let's, for an example, say mid-thigh. Yeah. They'll lower it, which can create a stretching effect, and they immediately go mm-hmm. with the lift. So you could get a stretch reflex or an elastic rebound yeah. type effect. If you're doing it from the blocks, it's a static start. You're not really supporting the weight, so it's it's a little bit different. But on the other side of the coin, if you're doing everything from the hang, it's very stressful to the posterior chain. And the lower back gets beat up. Yeah, low back, hamstring, glutes. So the box lift from the static start, you're not loaded at all. You quickly tense up and go. go. Yeah. So you don't have the possible fatigue if you're doing quite a number of reps that you would get from, from doing the hang starting, let's say, mid, mid-thigh mid roughly. Now, both, I think, have that. Right, right. But again, the coach has to think, how much volume am I doing with my athletes at this point in the training cycle? And if you're doing a good bit of volume, then fatigue is definitely uh, something to worry about. So maybe putting in at least some box pulls yeah. or box power snatch or box power clean would make sense even though the hang might be more specific overall but it's factoring in the other stressors going on the other stressors I, and and you're you're still going to get to use the hang the the benefits of the hang clean it's just you cut it back a little bit and put emphasis on another related right. lifting move. It, it's almost interesting too because from my perspective i'm sitting there going all right well what if what if from a hang, you're you're potentiated. You, like you're you're gonna be you're gonna you're gonna have that stretch reflex or the stretch shortening cycle um, from that hang. And I'm like trying to think through the physiology behind it now, is, or the even the biomechanics is that now if you if you could sit there as a coach and say, 
that might not be the best because if you've got – I'm thinking about it from my perspective. If I have a swimmer who's coming off the blocks, they're in their start position. They're not going to have – they'll have a slight stretch reflex. Right, very slight. But it's going to be more of a dynamic isometric. When they grab the blocks, there's going to be a one, two, go. So they have that isometric that's dynamic while they're holding. So actually, going back to the specificity thing that you brought up, is that if you have a swimmer or or uh, even a sprinter coming out of the blocks too, a 100-meter sprinter, yep. it might make more sense to focus more on the block work if they've got a bad start. Or they're coming off if they're bad off the wall if they're a swimmer because then they're going to have more specific movement patterns that is that dynamic isometric as opposed to that eccentric preload that that you would we, that you would be getting. Yeah, you you made very good points with two excellent examples. The sprint start is out of the blocks. It's a static position that's held for a second, yeah. couple seconds at yeah. most. Uh, the swimmer off the block, same kind of thing. So I agree, you know, maybe it's better to put a little more emphasis on a static lifting, explosive lifting movement. But in a thrower, yeah, it's, 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 it's the it, Yeah, 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 exactly. So it, it doesn't mean the thrower can't do a static right. lift occasionally for variation, but they probably should definitely emphasize mm-hmm. the hang where you get the, the more dynamic stretch shortening type cycle movement. Right. I think that's and I, I what's funny for me is that with with my throwers specifically, I love high hangs, mm-hmm. but these guys get so stupid strong. Like if I have a I have guys that can you know high hang 140 150 kilos in a snatch or or can power clean 180, but if we're doing that frequently and we're taking the volume of throws that we're taking, their backs get destroyed. And then it's like if we go off the blocks, it's like it's so much less stress on their back. And and it's a little bit more relative to their standing throw. I guess so that's where I want to take this is that you know, you worked with Dave Lout, who's uh, one of the I believe he threw seventy feet with a glide in the spin. I could be wrong about that, but I know he's I think that's correct. Okay. I and I'm I think he might have even done that before Oldfield did, but either way, he's he's a an Olympic medalist in the shot, uh, one of the best American shot putters. I'd say top fifteen of all, top twenty of all time. It sucks that right now the last five years American shot putters just are blowing the doors off the the old school guys because it's phenomenal right now what's going on in the U.S. with American shot put. But anyway. Um, what was what was that like, and what did you see or notice from from the using those Olympic lifts? And maybe I don't know if you're around Al Forbach because I know he was involved with Olympic lifting a bit. Right. Um, but spending that time with Dave Lout, um, what did you do? How did you manage stuff like that from the Olympic lifting perspective, and not have too much of a load that could potentially beat him up? You know, while he was throwing. Yeah, well, I had a a good bit of experience at that point. We're talking about uh, when I went to to, uh, UCLA in uh, mid-70s, let's say. I had a good bit of experience in weightlifting and thinking about training for weightlifting. And fatigue is, is always a critical consideration. So when I went to work with the throwers... I, I talk to them. This is an important point of uh, coaching. You know, talk to the athletes that you're beginning to work with to find out as much as you can. And talk to them during the training weeks. Mm-hmm. Like, how's your back feel today? I mean, yeah. a simple question. Yeah, real simple. But if they say, oh, I, I feel great, okay, then what the training has been is probably not bad right. for them. But if they say, man, my back feels stiff and... I just don't feel explosive, then you know you are fatiguing those, I call it posterior chain yeah. uh, muscles, which tend to be weak in a lot of athletes yeah. that didn't start with lifting from the, the floor. So it helps me make recommendations for their training. And I keep in touch. And I find out, you know, did that feel good when you did this, you know, hang work versus box work versus floor work? Right. So again, it's it's the coach communicating regularly with with the athlete. I remember an example with Dave where things can be misinterpreted. I said, let's let's do a little bit of block work, block pulls. 
Well, the idea was pulling with the bar sitting on blocks that were low, like two, three inches, to decrease the range of motion, take the load off the back at liftoff. This is when I was, uh, I guess, in, in Auburn. So we communicated by mail and sometimes by phone call. But he interpreted it as pulling from the block, standing on a block. Oh, so he's doing a greater range. Opposite yeah, greater range of what motion. I wanted. Now yeah. we found out about that quickly, but yeah. it, it's an example of how important it is to have clear communication yep. and be careful that different people sometimes use different terms yeah. for a very similar uh, movement. So the the bottom line, I think, to answer your question is is the communication with the athlete. If they're coming in to do a specific workout, let's say it was from the floor. And you talk to them first, and they say, my back feels fatigue. Okay, we, we wipe out the yeah, floor, and yeah. we go to the block above the knee. Yeah. Or we drop it completely today. Yeah. So it is an art in making adjustments, and they can only be made properly, or the best chance of them being the appropriate change is if you have constant communication. I think, I think that's one of the things, too, is that a lot of people have brought up to me is, what is this boom of shot put? Like... 75 feet was first, second, and third place at the World Championships this year. And I think that if you look at it, uh, one is just social media and uh, the internet alone. You just get this, you have the world at your fingertips. But two is the communication. Because for my own personal experience, what you just said is, and I remember Dr. B saying about this with Yuri Sadiq, is that he was in uh, Moscow writing letters to Yuri Sadiq in France, and that's how they were, he was training remotely, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Whereas today, I can communicate with athletes by uh, walkie-talkie app, I can text message them, I can send them videos, I can FaceTime, right. I can show them an Instagram or a right, right. Facebook, a YouTube, whatever it is, email, and you sit here and, you, and it's like, this is where we're at, and this is why sports science is, is blowing up, and this is why coaching is getting so so much more advanced yeah, yeah. but then at the same time i'm sitting here frustrated going why hasn't anybody done research on blocks versus the hangs you know and, and yeah. i don't and maybe it is just a it's an aspect of interest too but um it's it's inter interesting for me to see it from the that applied world and just say like dude why isn't this happening you know so i i, I think too one, one of the interesting points is that you can like, I don't know if you have direct experience with force plates and if this would even show you. I was watching a, a, a study where they were doing a behind the neck push press. And I worked a little bit with uh, Zygmunt Smalzerts, who was at the Olympic Training Center. He's Polish. Yeah, yeah. And so he knew the Polish throws coach really well. So when I would go out there, he knew that I was a shot putter and a discus or worked with shot putters and discus throwers. And he had said to me, all that, you know, the, the Polish guys, they've got a really good discus guy. And at the time, um, Majewski was a two-time Olympic champ in the, in, the, in the shot, and he was actually a glider. And he said they would always do behind-the-neck jerks, constantly behind-the-neck jerk all the time because of the, the, the force production is pretty similar to the throw mm -hmm. to a, to a counter-movement jump, and that that counter-movement jump indirectly ha it has been shown to have a really strong correlation – to the results of the throw, and I guess one I wanted to know if you had if you had any any experience using the plates to measure to measure power output, or if that I've used force plates not to directly measure power output, although you you can do that. I used it to look at force application patterns, and the... impulse patterns, okay. and I was frankly kind of stunned when I found that the vertical jump force application so it's a force time graph force vertical time yeah. horizontal and that force time is impulse so I, I looked at the force time patterns and damn the vertical jump and the second pull were very very similar and when I thought about, it, well, you know, it, it makes sense. Yeah. So there's a tool. I mean, they're force mats, they're force plates. Force plates are very 
precise, but you need uh, the installation to be proper, and uh, there's some difficulty in getting it exactly the way you'd want to use with athletes. Force mats are simpler, much simpler, but not as accurate. There's also other types of newer technology that's used in recording performance characteristics and parameters. They're available to many people, they're, they're cheaper, but you need to have people who know how to use them right and who have the interest because applied sports science research of the type you're talking about, it's very hard to get funding. Yeah. And so you got to find somebody who has the knowledge of using this equipment and how to analyze the information and pass it on to coaches and athletes. And they're not just sitting around everywhere waiting for something to do for free. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did so much work on my own time because I was a weightlifter and I was interested. Yeah. And I had access to equipment at the universities where I worked. But to, to do that for a larger variety of uh, athletic events, and you're focused on the throws, you have to have the people who have the knowledge and the desire to do it without getting paid in many cases. Well, so, so going off that, I, that's interesting because I've seen, even with Gal, uh, Andy Galpin, I think he's at Fullerton maybe. I think that might be where he's done his research at. Um, he's a younger guy, and I was... I've noticed that he's starting to do it, and, and I don't know if this is the way research is going to go, is that a lot of these guys are doing really good research, but they they might not have a a position where they're just making tons and tons of cash at, at the university. But if they start to dab dabble around with, you know, he's worked with guys in the UFC, um, he's worked with guys in the NFL, and now all of a sudden he's got, maybe he's got this research side here, and then he's got his, his professional gig over here. And my issue with that is then it becomes like, is there some um, weird like overlap between his professional side where he's you know using his website and using uh, social media and using marketing to make to make it more financially feasible for him to continue to do that research? I don't I don't know if you've had any exposure to that or if you've seen that or if that would even be a, an issue or a problem within within the world of research. Well, most faculty positions at, at bigger universities that have the kind of equipment that might be desirable, they tend to want the professors to be getting grant money. Okay. So who are you going to apply to to do certain types of studies in a shot put? Well, maybe uh, an organization, I don't know what the, the federation that controls shot putting is called, but USA Weightlifting maybe could supply some funding or some help to someone doing weightlifting right. research. Maybe in shot putting or throwing the in USATF. General, you could find some support, but you usually have to produce something of value and interest before they're going to look at you closely. Right. So it, uh, the the main answer to your question, why why isn't there research being done in this? Is you got to have equipment, you got to have people with knowledge how to use the equipment, how to interpret the results, and how to communicate it to coaches and athletes. And you're not going to find a lot of those people. Okay. So that's why there's less uh, being done than you'd like. And that's why I, I would like to have done more with force plates. Yeah. And with some of the modern equipment, you don't have to sit and hand digitize things. It can be done automatically to save time. So the need is for sports scientists in the different sport disciplines. All right. So I've got a ton more questions, but I think I want to ask two of them off air because one just relates to uh, Soviet. Well, I'll ask you right now. Did you? I So one of my biggest books that has impacted me was a textbook on weightlifting from Arkady Vorobiev. Yes. And I and that's where I like that that was done in like the mid seventies, early seventies. And I always wondered, like, back then, was there ever any overlap between, you know, Soviet Russia and what they were doing and what you were doing at the time as basically the lead Olympic weightlifting researcher in the US, or was that just completely almost non existent? It was pretty much non existent. A language barrier is one thing. A lot is published in Russian and 
if I you know knew Russian, yeah, okay, I different. could follow it. But otherwise, it depend on someone like Bud Sharnica who translated Russian training in some of the mechanics-related uh, articles that he found. So the transfer is is impeded by the language barrier. And yeah, th there was a lot of great stuff out of Russia. Vorobiev's textbook is well known, and there's good information in there, but it's vastly extended or and expanded from uh, more modern sports scientists in, in Russia because they had more to work with, more equipment. Yeah. And uh, it's an unfortunate fact that you generally transfer information between uh, sports scientists of different countries at large conferences, international conferences, and uh, those can be expensive to attend. So there's, there's great potential and many possibilities, but the practical side of how it's going to happen is impeded by financial considerations as well as the number of interested and available properly trained sports scientists. Okay. Okay, so I know I said that I wanted to keep this to 30 to 30 minutes. That didn't happen, but I want to finish this. So what I usually will do with guests on my podcast is I I call it the red hot minute. So I ask you five questions. You can give me a a long answer if you want, but they're like fun fun yeah. questions. Yeah. Um and so Dr. Garhammer is actually from originally from Reading, Pennsylvania, which is where Garage Strength is based, just outside Reading. Initially, we were based closer to the city. Um, so I'm going to ask you some sports-related questions and then also some, some geographic questions, just, sure. just, for, just to finish up the podcast. So sure. earlier you had mentioned uh, your tri the, the tri-tip cut, which I feel like Western, like California people really only know what tri-tip steaks are, at least – most people out east don't. And I've seen San Francisco has their own version of a tri-tip cheesesteak. So I, my question is, what's better, a tri-tip cheesesteak or a cheesesteak from Philly? Well, they're probably pretty comparable <laughs> if you're talking about protein content. No, I'm talking like you just want to crush some a, a whole bunch of food. What's available <laughs> is the key thing. As long as it's good protein yeah, source. Yeah. You know, if, if it's a filet mignon steak or if it's chopped up steak in a sandwich, pretty similar. Maybe the fat content's a little different. Right, right. Okay. Um, power snatch or power clean? For a lot of athletes, I like the power snatch. Okay. A little bit more range of motion, a little faster yep. uh, finish to the, to the lift. That just justifies my entire my entire existence as, as a strength coach, Jason. Just so you know. Well, the, the the other thing is is people have trouble in many situations catching the bar properly. Yeah, in the clean. Because of you know shoulder flexibility, whatever. Whereas the power snatch, you catch overhead, and most people can do that. Yeah. They can adjust the width of their grip right. to be comfortable to them, and over time probably go to a little wider grip but i've seen a lot of problems with people catching and holding that's the shoulders. That's, that's what i've always like my own experience has always been snatch is easier for me to coach to teach people than the clean mm -hmm. and what's weird is that you see the the like the american football world and they're always cleaning and i'm always sitting there like it's easier to train even in a bigger group. It's easier to train the snatch. And I've worked with, you know, football teams of 75, 80 people, and I've had all of the guys snatching. It's like, I don't know where that disconnect has happened with the, the American, like the strength coaches for, for American football, because it's, for me, time-wise, it's always been easier to, to educate somebody how to move with the snatch than, than with the clean, because they don't have that, that issue with the front rack. Right, and a related uh, consideration, you mentioned Zygmunt and, and your connection, or his connection to the Polish throw coaches and their use of behind-the-neck jerks. Yeah. Why aren't they using the jerks in the front? First of all, it's hard to, as hell to hold yeah. for a lot of people. Yep. And, and to keep a steady uh, position when you dip and drive within the front. But it's much easier to hold All your back. It's way neck. easier, yeah, yeah. So, it's way more. It's so comfortable behind the neck, and you can use a wider grip easily yeah. behind the neck. Yep. 
So the catch position for behind the neck jerk and the catch position for snatch have some Are similarities. Very similar. yeah. 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 Okay. This this one's for my powerlifting friends. Low bar back squat or, or high bar back squat? Well, for powerlifting, right back to specificity, If you, what you want to do is the, the greatest weight you can for a passable squat. <laughs> yeah. Low bar probably works well for most people. But if you're using the squat for uh, sports training for other sports than powerlifting, I think the high bar squat that Olympic lifters primarily use is the better way to go. Okay, so now we take that high bar. If you had one lift, one squat version to choose, you get the high bar back squat or the front squat. What are you picking? I would pick the front if they can hold the bar okay. securely yep. without creating problems. Yeah. And I think that, so I would pick the front as well. Um, and one thing I wanted to talk about was even like torso stability is something that people are never like trunk stability is something that, that, that is never really talked about in sports performance. And it, and it's sort of odd because if you sat there and looked at it from a strictly sports performance perspective, even, you know, if you, if you can envision like Barry Sanders juking back in the day or, or, you know, or a basketball player cutting back and forth, the guys that cut the best have the best trunk stability mm -hmm. and they're learning that you know you can get that directly applied from catching a power clean or catching a snatch or or front squatting or high bar back squatting because you learn that trunk stability and even the best sprinters in the world have the best sprinters in the world are the ones that have the most efficient trunk stability because they lose they don't they're not losing that energy side to side and that's where with the front squat it's like i mean both both the lifts are great for it but I think that that's like the forgotten, you know, step brother or stepsister or whatever that no one really ever brings up is that the the trunk stability that you gain from a front squat is is phenomenal. And that's why the best speed skaters in the world are doing it. Yeah, know? yeah. And any kind of overhead lift or supporting heavy weights overhead really requires strength in the torso to yeah. stabilize everything, and thus a certain assistance exercise work. Is important, and we we can talk about abdominal work. I love the hyperextension; it was my yep. golden lift for the low back area, and specifically uh, Romanian deadlifts. Th that didn't work so well for me. I, I had an SI problem a couple of times from doing heavy Romanian deadlifts, but hyperextensions, I love it. Right. So again. Put some of that into the training, maybe emphasize it farther out from main competitions, and find out what works for your athlete. Yeah, yeah. And and, and and is that where you would even say as far as somebody who's squatting like ass to grass versus somebody who'd be squatting to 90 degrees, or would you always recommend squatting ass to grass? Well, range? I'd look at it as to what are they going to do in sport. In weightlifting, the low position in the squat I think has some value because it relates very closely to catching a squat snatch or squat clean. Somebody who's in a throwing sport or a static start things we talked about like sprinters, maybe they don't need to go that low because clearly the lower you go the more stress is placed on the structures that support the knee. Yeah. So why risk it? if it doesn't really relate well to what's going on in that athlete's competitive world. Mm -hmm. I would argue to risk it because the shot putters are, and discus servers are the most immobile athletes on the planet, and, get, and getting them into that range can benefit them from a mobility perspective. Right, but it can be done with light weights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. I'm thinking in terms of their heavier squatting. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's not good there, but if, if they use it for warm up so they have a light day, maybe increasing the range of motion Absolutely, is a good yeah. idea. For sure. If, as long as it doesn't bother them. Yeah. You know, if they're limping the next day, you know, they, they don't have the ability to go that far down. Okay, so give me give me a comparison. What's it like living in California or, or now Arizona versus uh, Reading, Pennsylvania? Well, you have a lot of considerations, economic, weather-wise, and so forth. I, I think a, a key consideration wherever you are is, are there people and coaches to work with in what your interest is in sport? Yeah. When I grew up, I, I mentioned to you earlier, York, PA was the mecca of weightlifting in the United States. So living in Reading, I could see top lifters compete in local meets. Mm-hmm. 
if you're in an area where there's few lifters, then it's hard to watch top people unless you travel a lot. And watching top people, I think, is a valuable Absolutely. addition to an overall training uh, program. Yeah, especially sure. in the early years of your career. Yeah, because you're not just watching them. You're, I mean, yes, you're just watching them, but you're not just you're not just seeing them move. You're seeing them take on that everyday training, and, and, and if you're around them all the time, what are they doing outside of training? And that, that's where we were talking about the, the theory of, of uh, from Celia's uh, stress theory, or um, uh, why can't I think of the, his, his actual, the actual term behind it, but what stress can do to you as an organism. And, and if you're around the best athletes or the best throwers or the best football players, whatever it might be, you get to see how they can how they handle themselves on a day to day right, basis, and right. that's that's what you know. A training environment is a training environment is more important than wherever you're, you're like that geographic location. That's a great way to say it. You need to have a good training environment, which involves other athletes who are really focused on the sport, and you need a good coach. Mm -hmm. So who cares where it is? You know, exactly. is it in Alaska? Is it in Florida? Yeah. That's not the critical thing. It's the environment, the training environment, and also maybe the environment surrounding training. Yeah. You know, in some areas you can get into a lot of trouble. You can waste a lot of time partying and whatnot. Yeah. So there needs to be some level of focus. And I'm not a, you know, a strict person about cutting everything out. I'm, I'm more of a moderation person and avoid things that are clearly not going to help you right. in, make, in reaching your goals. Yeah. And that's where you can even factor in like costs of living, costs sure. of food, and stuff like that. So, sure. all right, Doctor Garhammer, thank you so much for being on this podcast. I had a ton of fun, and I'm sure that when we get off of here, I'm going to ask you 300 more questions. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad we could do this and uh, maybe get some useful information out there that'll help uh, various coaches and athletes. Absolutely. All right, thanks again. And if you guys want to check out anything that we're selling at Garage, go over to GarageStrength.com. You can check out our blog, and you can follow us on Instagram at GarageStrength. Follow us on Twitter at GarageStrength. Subscribe to our email newsletter, and you'll get a whole bunch of goodies out of this podcast. Peace.